This video is brought to you by OKCoin Crypto Exchange, where you can buy, sell, and trade your favorite cryptocurrencies, and you don't have to pay high fees. OKCoin has very low fees, lower than many of the other crypto exchanges in the market. You can also stake your cryptocurrencies and keep 100% of the rewards. There are no fees. Other exchanges charge fees. OKCoin allows you to keep 100% of the rewards. Sign up with OKCoin, link in the description. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Thinking Crypto channel, your home for crypto news and interviews. With me today is Hugo Filion, who's the co-founder and CEO of Flare Networks. Hugo, it's great to have you on the show. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Hugo, uh, I am very intrigued by all the things that Flare Networks is doing. Lots to talk about. I have a lot of questions from the community, but let's start with your background. Where are you from? Where did you grow up? Uh, I'm British. I grew up in London, um, lived in a, a few places around the world, but uh, mostly uh, in London. And what did you do before you started Flare Networks or co-founded, I should say? You know, what was your background from school? Where did you work? Uh, so uh, my, my background is in finance. Uh, I predominantly... Uh, traded options uh, for a number of different funds, uh, mostly in the commodity space. And when did you first discover, I, I would say, Bitcoin or crypto? Uh, as most people start their journey in crypto from Bitcoin, you know, did someone tell you about it? Did you read about it on a forum? How did you come across it? Uh, well, actually, uh, I think I was probably, I heard about it quite early. Uh, in that there was uh, a group of people, predominantly, I think, mostly from Goldman, uh, who, who were talking about Bitcoin quite a lot. Uh, there was a lot of debate as to whether it would do anything, whether it would be anything. Um, but uh, some of those people from Goldman uh, sort of ended up becoming very, very big in, in, in the crypto space. And, and I think you know who I'm talking about. Uh, but... Um, I, I kind of uh, I was very uh, young at that that point, and I just kind of I bought a little bit, and I sold far too early. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, such is life. Um, so I have to ask, what are you holding your crypto portfolio? You, you mentioned you had some Bitcoin, but you sold a bit early. You know, as of today, what's in your crypto portfolio? Uh, I have Bitcoin, I have XRP, uh, I have Ethereum, quite a lot of Songbird. Um, <laughs> which is not overly surprising. Um, and, and, and that's it for now. Uh, so let's talk about Flare Networks. I, I wanted you to give us um, kind of the history. Why did you decide, decide to start Flare Networks? Uh, what is its purpose and mission? And you, you can give, go run through all of those things for us. Uh, so myself and my co-founder, Sean Rowan, and our uh, chief scientist, Nairi, uh, we met uh, sort of when we were sort of uh, centered around UCL, which is University College London. Um, and we, we really uh, started talking about crypto, started thinking about what to do in the space. Um, we weren't set on building either a network or a consensus protocol from the outset. Uh, really, we started out just researching the space as best as we could, uh, quite, quite slowly. Um, and we, we increasingly became uncomfortable with the consensus approaches uh, that people were taking. Um, specifically, people were looking to scale um, using uh, proof, proof of stake, uh, and often they still are. Uh, and proof of stake has its place, um, especially we think for you know, networks where uh, you might wish to transfer uh, you know, a, a definable amount of value over a definable rail for a particular amount of time. Uh, where we uh, have some issues with proof of stake is, is we're, we're not certain that the guarantees around uh, proof of stake necessarily hold up uh, when you have multiple networks, uh, when you have lots of interactions with uh, external, um, let's say, external financial networks, whether those be decentralized or centralized. Um, and we're not necessarily sure if we understand that uh, proof of stake scales uh, essentially arbitrarily uh, so as to uh, basically be able to shift huge amounts of economic value, essentially some large amount of the sum of human progress 
onto a proof of stake network because uh, in order to do that, you would have to have uh, a really a very large amount of collateral capital underpinning uh, that proof of stake network. So we we think that's yet to be uh, proven out. Um, and really, we we came at Flair with a slightly different angle, which was that there's already uh, a, 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 a type of algorithm uh, which was sort of pretty much pioneered by XRP and then uh, adapted by Stellar. Uh, which is called Federated Byzantine Agreement. Uh, and it's just a, a different way of solving the stable attack. So proof of stake solves it uh, essentially by, by using stake. FBA solves it in a different way. Uh, the Stellar paper is particularly good for understanding how it solves it. Um, although it is uh, necessarily uh, much more complex than just the idea of staking. Um, so we, we, we thought that it would be really interesting to have a hedge against proof of stake uh, as, as a network. Um, and, and so we set about thinking, how, how can we turn an FBA network, uh, similar to Stellar or XRP, into a, a fully fledged um, uh, smart contract network? And that, that led us to work on, on something called the Flare Consensus Protocol, uh, which is uh, sort of the, the, the base set of ideas uh, that we're building Flare around. Although uh, Flare is currently built on an adapted version of the Avalanche consensus protocol. So mm. Avalanche adapted to uh, federated Byzantine agreement. Uh, there's some specific reasons why we can do that. It's probably a bit complex to go, go, in, go into right now. Um, but the specific use cases we're setting Flare up, uh, Flare up for allow us to do that quite, uh, quite nicely. Uh, and in a way that really decentralizes really finds a, an elegant way, I think, to decentralize uh, a, a, a federated Byzantine agreement network, which has always been people's, um, I guess, uh, uh, a contention, bone of contention with, with, with FBA networks is that they are hard to decentralize because it is quite hard to, um, to build in uh, essentially to, to decentralize trust relationships. Uh, and so we've we've built this we're building this specific set of use cases for for Flare, um, and 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 that finds uh, essentially uh, a, a way to decentralize the formation of an FBA network, which we're extremely happy with. Um, so I think maybe I'll leave that question there. Um, so I initially when I heard about the Flare networks. Um, I heard about the use case of bringing smart contracts to XRP. Now you guys have added uh, support for other assets like Doge and I believe um, it was announced Algorand and things like that. Can you tell us about the assets and how you're enabling smart contracts for those different assets? So really what we're enabling and all, uh, it's, it's, it's XRP, mm -hmm. Litecoin, Stellar, Doge, uh, Algorand at this point. Um, and we can add essentially uh, as many other networks, and probably uh, probably we would we would certainly hope that that gets added through governance. Um, uh, Bitcoin, of course, being the obvious one, uh, you know, a, a massive store of value. And 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 really, why did we come at it this way? Well, uh, you've got these huge communities and this massive amount of value uh, that is kind of locked out of the smart contract system today. Uh, some people say, oh, but you can wrap Bitcoin. We can't wrap Bitcoin. You can't do that in a way that is uh, trustless. Mm -hmm. So um, you, you've got the issues with either having to use a, uh, a registered custodian or uh, a bridge, which actually today, pretty much every bridge model we look at is actually really just a, a, an unregistered custodian. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, basically, they custody your funds, but they're not registered and there's no financial protection for that. No regulator is uh, looking after them. And uh, it's basically as, um, you know, it, it's pretty dangerous. So these are cross-chain bridges we're talking about, not things like plasma or, or, or whatever, but cross-chain bridges that people are using to get value from one chain to another. And really the way that Flare does it is it creates what we think is uh, a, a, a genuinely, for the first time, a trustless bridge, so a bridge that doesn't have a custodian, uh, a bridge that uh, if the multi-sig wallet behind it bricks, uh, 
uh, well, there is no multi-sig wallet in the in in, in the Flare bridge, uh, but ultimately the existing bridges use some form of multi-sig, um, whether they like to tell you about it or not. Um, and when that multi-sig bri multi-sig bricks, ultimately there's no way to recover those funds. So the nice thing that we've done uh, with our trustless bridge is that we've essentially moved the bridge uh, or the key components of the bridge to the consensus level. And we then use consensus to essentially manage that bridge. Um, and what that means is that, you know, little bits of it, so each particular uh, person or set of relationships inside of the bridge, they can brick, they can die, uh, they can go wrong. Uh, but the system itself as a whole can carry on. And that's a massively key difference between what we're doing with Flare and uh, how, how bridges have traditionally been structured. And that's, we can only do that because of FBA. Um, so just to go back to your original question, how is Flare doing smart contracts for these networks? So we're not building smart contracts into XRP or Doge. What we are doing is we are enabling XRP, Doge, Litecoin, Stella, Algorand uh, to come uh, to Flare and to be used with smart contracts really in a way that we think is the first trustless way. Um, and so that's, that's, a, that's a very key uh, key difference to, to what we're doing. And so, you know, why, why would that be uh, interesting? I mean, just to name one particular use case, uh, the first use case would be, be the first time really you could swap all of those tokens, you could trade all of those tokens in a decentralized way on a blockchain against each other. Um, and so that, that essentially creates a, a form of cross-chain liquidity that's never been seen before. And would, would another use case be potentially because the smart contract technology is enabled on for these assets uh, to do some sort of lending as well as uh, uh, of course so anything anything that already exists in DeFi you could do with with on flare with these new sources of value that have been untapped xrp doge litecoin stella uh, eventually maybe bitcoin anything that the community wants to add um, I know that the Digibyte community, shout out to Digibyte, uh, are very excited about potentially putting in a governance proposal to, to integrate that um, uh, and, and, and various others. So, uh, you know, there's anything you can think of, whether it's, um, you know, swaps, lending, you know, any, any form of DeFi protocol, really, that, um, you know, that you want to, want to, want to build uh, can be built. Uh, that's awesome. And my next question is going to be about security. Tell us about the security that Flare Networks leverages, um, because we've seen a lot of DeFi hacks. And I think anything that is version 1.0 is going to have flaws. There, there has to be multiple iterations to, to fine tune it. Um, what are you guys doing to protect funds and, and things along those lines? I'll go to, I guess, the specifics in a minute. Um, but I think it's worth thinking about the 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 theory, uh, like the high level first. So uh, if you look at the bridge models that many people are using, there's this concentration of risk. There's some multi-sig account on, on like, let's say Ethereum and some multi-sig account on some other chain. And that is essentially the bridge. Uh, whether there's then a, a regulated custodian in the middle or some kind of, um, I don't know, thing that is, kind of pretending to be not regulated and not a custodian, it doesn't really matter. There's basically two addresses on either side and there's massive concentration of risk between that entire setup. So, you know, if, if uh, some grouping of, of people who control those addresses um, uh, loses, you know, their, their, their private keys or, or whatever, that entire system can be attacked or bricked. And so, uh, really taking lessons from, I suppose, in some ways, uh, my financial background is we wanted to create a model where there was no concentration of risk. Mm -hmm. So, because um, uh, a lot of what we see in the existing DeFi community and a lot of the reason why you see these big rug pulls and things is, is a big concentration of risk all into one address, uh, one application, one thing. And so at least with uh, Flare, our bridge, um, uh, essentially separates out all of the constituent parties. 
such that um, you know we massively spread risk across the system as opposed to concentrating it all in, down into one point. And that's 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 very uh, a very important uh, structural design decision. Um, so at Flare, we are really only concerned with building the bridge in the best way that we can. We we can't be responsible for the applications um, that that launch on Flare. Uh, so what we're doing to start with is taking it slowly, slowly, slowly. Um, and about uh, three, three months ago, three, four months ago, we decided we tested enough internally that we really needed to start testing in production, but um, with some way to kind of mitigate potential risk by telling the whole world this is the software that we're testing. It's not finished. Um, please do use it because it needs to be tested with some value, but please don't throw your life savings into it because it mm. has much more risk than the what will be the finished product. Um, and that's, that is, you asked me earlier, uh, you know, some questions about uh, that we'll come to in a bit about exchanges. That was the statement uh, that like exchanges took, you know, will take issue with, and we'll come to that in a minute. But um, ultimately, we've started Songbird. It's what we call our canary network. Um, it's 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 purpose right now is for testing the core protocols that we have developed. So those are really three core protocols. That's the Flare Time Series Oracle, and that's already on the network. It's already got more than I think. Uh, 16, 17% of the entire tokens that have been issued. Um, so the entire 15 billion Songbird tokens that have been issued delegated to it. It's working and it's paying out rewards. And we already have, um, I think we're going to be putting forward a governance proposal in the next couple of days or a week uh, to, to make them in some changes to that uh, protocol. Uh, that we have already observed that will make it better and you know work better or faster, so you know just 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 better generally. So that's the first protocol, the Flare Time Series Oracle. Uh, the second protocol, which is uh, really in in some ways the the key to what we're doing, um, is is called the State Connector, uh, and the State Connector uh, works at the validator level, uh, and it allows essentially the entire blockchain, the, the network, so in this case, Songbird, in the future Flare, to come to consensus over what has happened on another chain. So it's like um, it's like an oracle on steroids. Uh, you know, so uh, oracles generally work at the, um, you know, maybe the, the uh, virtual machine layer, the smart contract layer. Uh, this smart, this state connector works at the network layer, and that's a, a much deeper, much more, uh, a much more important uh, place to put it because it means that that's actually deriving safety from the from the whole network, uh, and so that allows the network to basically it's a core network um, uh, protocol. It allows the network to come to consensus over the state of another chain, uh, and then those two things, the FTSO and the state connector then allow us to build what we call the F assets. Mm. Uh, and when I was talking about a bridge earlier, what we're really talking about is the F assets. So the F assets is how we get XRP, Doge, Litecoin, Stellar, all of that lot, Algorand onto Flare, or in this case, in the early days, Songbird. And so Songbird's the canary network for now. And then in the future, uh, it will be used for uh, testing potential upgrades to Flare, or uh, so it'll always be much more, um, I guess, advanced to Flare. Flare will be like the, hopefully the sort of slower sibling uh, where it's been tested a lot more um, and it's much more, I suppose, um, institutional, much more, you know, you would, you would be much more comfortable putting large amounts of volume and value on it. Uh, whereas Songbird being the, the uh, canary network, you it will have kind of much more exciting, newer features, uh, upgrades to everything. Uh, and that will be um, essentially the long-term purpose of Songbird. However, Songbird can go in a different direction 
to flare if it wishes. Uh, and what I mean by that is, you know, there's variables around the, the, the functionality that we're bringing. It's like, you know, we, we have at the moment, I think we have 12 different data series uh, that is in the FTSO. Now, the Songbird may wish to have different data on, on it to flare. Um, or it may wish to have different tokens that it bridges to its network or more tokens that it bridges than Flare. So it, it can, can make its own decisions and it can cease to be the canary network if the token holders of Songbird wish for that to be the case. Got it. So to, to uh, summarize, uh, Songbird is really the testing ground, but will eventually run alongside uh, FLR um, and they will be doing different things um, while running at the same time. Yeah, and really that's the best risk mitigation strategy we can think of to, to cover the, the, the question you put, which is there's been a hell of a lot of hacks in DeFi. How do you, how do you handle that? Well, the best way we can do it is by uh, bringing something into production, mm -hmm. having some value on it, hoping and also working ourselves, but it, it's much more useful when uh, you have essentially an exposure to the entire world, but a controlled exposure to the entire world, such that you know people can actually look at the protocols and, and they can say, I can make a hundred grand right now if I break this. Mm. Um, you know, at which point, sure, it's a loss, but it's a loss that A, we said there's a potential for loss. Um, but secondly, it makes the whole system better. So, uh, you know, hopefully it doesn't happen. Hopefully there's no bugs at all, uh, but it's uh, much better for us to follow this strategy and to say, here's a risky network, let's test on it. Uh, then to say, here's a finished product, uh, throw everything you have at it. Yeah. That's what everyone else is doing. Right. And that's why you end up losing 60, 100, whatever million. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that's a the smart way to do it. Um, it's it kind of crawl, walk, run, test, you know, test the waters a bit before you go uh, yeah. full launch. Um, Fine too. I want to ask about Ethereum virtual machine because yeah, I read mm -hmm. the Flare network leverages an EVM. Um, and also, are there plans to use other virtual machines? So uh, we use the Ethereum virtual machine because it's basically the standard that everyone builds in. Mm. Um, so if you look at all the applications, you know, uh, all of the DeFi applications uh, that you can, you can think of, uh, Maker, Uniswap, Curve, Aave, these are all built essentially in Solidity smart contract language, which is, uh, you know, what the EVM runs. Uh, there are, I believe, other virtual machines in the offing. Uh, however, none of them have gotten any traction yet, me meaningful traction. Um, I think, first of all, I think the EVM will continue being upgraded by the Ethereum Foundation and by the Ethereum community. And so I, I think it'll probably remain the de facto standard for a long time. Uh, and they will probably capture whatever innovation comes along from any other virtual machine team. Um, but uh, let's say there was some virtual machine that uh, people were really hyped about, but the EVM was still also used a lot on Flare. Um, one of the things that's important to understand is that, you know, with today's kind of knowledge of how uh, blockchains work and, 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 and essentially the computation model for blockchains, this is basically impossible to have two virtual machines essentially on the same blockchain at the same time. Uh, so, um, but that doesn't mean that there isn't a model where a Flare constellation of networks uh, could have networks that are running different virtual machines. It's not something we're building, it's not something we're thinking about, but it's certainly something that could happen because we have this state connector which comes to consensus over another network. Then you could have two Flare networks, both with state connectors, that both come to consensus over each other, and one could be running Ethereum virtual machine, and one could be running some other virtual machine. So that's a plausible construction, but not something we are 
working on not something we're marketing, not something we're, you know, but certainly feasible. Right, right. Yeah, that makes sense. Maybe sometime later in the future, once uh, you, you've, you know, finished the work you're currently doing of uh, testing, you know, the network and so forth with Songbird. Um, so I want to talk about distribution. A lot of questions in the community. And I think, uh, you know, folks, sometimes they miss the timelines or they uh, are not keeping up with the news. So obviously some exchanges have announced they're going to be supporting Songbird. Um, yep. Tell us about the process of that distribution. Obviously we know folks who are eligible are the ones who participated in the XRP snapshot back in December. Yeah. 2020. Um, but what, what is the roadblock you think with some of the exchanges? Because some have not said anything like Coinbase and so forth. Maybe you can take us behind the curtain of what's happening and what we can expect. So um, I think it's really important for me to preface this with Songbird's a canary network. Mm. Our principal interest in the canary network is to test the protocols that will be uh, essentially the first rollout of Flare. Mm. And so, you know, we didn't do anywhere near the amount of haranguing of exchanges that we did with the Flare distribution. Um, Flare distribution is the most supported distribution that has ever happened, as far as I know, in 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 blockchain, you know, from 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 a you know a utility fork or or any kind of fork, um, and the fact that Songbird's getting support, which is, you know, for for essentially a fork for a canary network for something that we have explicitly stated is not the main net, mm -hmm. is is way beyond our expectations, and way beyond, to be honest with you much that has happened in the past. So um, I think the support for Songbird is extremely good uh, right now, way beyond what you should expect. Having said that, uh, I, I am well aware that there have been a number of exchanges that have said uh, either nothing or said that they're waiting for um, the network to become stable. Mm. So it's really important to address the stable point. Right. Um, the network is stable. Uh, it's done a million blocks. Um, when we talk about uh, you know, the things we want to test, the things that are un potentially unstable, these are things like the state connector. These are things like the FTSO. These are things like the F assets. These are the protocols that we want to launch. Ha the, they go on to the network, but they're not necessarily going to brick the network. They're not going to make the network unstable. Mm -hmm. um, so the network is stable. It's done a, you know, a, a very large number of blocks. That's not going to change. The protocols that we want to build onto the network are inherently, because they're very, very new, not stable. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't that doesn't stop an exchange from distributing the token. Um, they've simply read the they've read the blog incorrectly um, and not really understood what we've we've meant. Um, and and that's something we've found a, a lot with exchanges is that you know they they have so much bombarding them that they don't really have the time to process exactly where every project is. Uh, that being said, I can confirm that you know a large number of the exchanges that have um, essentially not said anything or um, have made comments where they're saying it's not stable, uh, you know, they are talking to us and working with us about, you know, trying to get information about the network, um, asking us to provide them information. So they're, they're actively, uh, thinking about it. I won't give you any names because I'm sure the teams there would not appreciate that. Sure. Um, and, and, and we must give them, if they are or aren't going to do anything, we must give them uh, room to make their own decision. Uh, we, we can't force anyone's hand. Yep. Uh, yeah, that, that absolutely makes sense. Um, and I think that's helpful that you, you clarify that. So uh, real quick question on that. Are you, is your team approaching the exchanges or the exchanges approaching you? Or is it, you know, a bit of both uh, in a sense like, hey, if you had XRP holders that were 
holding um, or right, let me back up because I know majority of the exchanges, even Coinbase and so forth, have put out literature saying we're going to support the Flare snapshot and the distribution of Flare tokens. Yeah. Um, but there was obviously no updates on Songbird. Um, are you guys approaching those exchanges that, hey, we have the Songbird tokens to distribute? would you like to participate? Is, is that kind of the, the dialogue that's happening? So to be frank, there's a hundred more than 110 exchanges that um, are supporting Flare, and we don't have time to approach 110 different exchanges. So we're letting exchanges come to us. Um, and we've been, so every, uh, every time Songbird has been distributed, it's been through an exchange basically coming to us and saying, what's Songbird about? Where is it? How, you know, please, can you give us some information about it? And so that's, <clears throat> that's the process. Um, it's also very important that as a Canary network that we, we're not actively, um, you know, uh, trying to, you know, excessively push it. Uh, it's really up to the community if and the community includes exchanges. It's really up to them if they want to, you know, want, want to do it. Uh, so, um, you know, we, we've, but, but of course we will bend over backwards uh, to, to make sure that uh, any exchange that comes to us and wants to distribute the token has the necessary information to make the decision. Um, and, you know, we have a team handling that. We just don't have uh, a team that can pod uh, 110 different, you know, more than 110 different exchanges. Now, I want to talk about the Flare token, the FLR token, AKA Spark token. Um, tell us about the use case for that and uh, governance around that once that is released. Um, obviously we're testing with Songbird right now, but once the Flare tokens are released, um, if you have maybe a timeline for that, I know testing is happening, but you know if it's six months from now, whatever it may be, and the governance around that. So uh, the Flare token and the Songbird token have similar use cases mm. in that we have these three protocols, the FTSO, State Connector, and the F assets. Um, and, and, and both tokens can be used for similar things. Okay. Uh, and and, 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 and uh, this will happen on Songbird first, but I will describe it really for Flare because Flare is the ultimate goal. Uh, the idea is that uh, the, the token FLR uh, is used sort of for two things. One, to delegate to the FTSO. Mm -hmm. So this is how um, this is how the network forms prices. And this is in production. It's operating on Songbird already. So it's quite nice. Uh, you can go and play around with this today. So to delegate to the FTSO, what that means is that each uh, FLR token has uh, essentially a vote um, associated with it. Uh, and you, you basically bestow that vote onto a data provider. So an entity that comes onto the network and says, I'm going to provide data on your behalf. Uh, you can set up your own data provider if you wish. Um, it's just, uh, it's, it's, it's quite a hassle, uh, but it's, it's not that much of a hassle either. So if you ha are technically inclined, please do reach out to us and set up a data provider. It's, it's quite good fun. Uh, and it's actually really, uh, rather, uh, you know, uh, profitable for data providers right now uh, in terms of the SGB that they're earning. Um, so that's quite, quite, quite a, 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 a nice way that it's, it's working. So you can delegate your vote to the data provider. That gives the network prices. Mm -hmm. So that gives the network uh, essentially, uh, at the moment, just prices, but we, that, that entire model can be um, extended to essentially any other piece of data that the network may you may need, or quite interestingly, any other network may need. Uh, and what I mean by that, we'll come on to that in a minute, if you don't mind. Um, so the first protocol is the FTSO, uh, and then really the state connector, let's park that because that's just kind of like a piece of functionality that enables the, um, the F assets and potentially a lot of other things to work. So uh, you then have the F assets, 
which are also driven by the flare token. Mm -hmm. So you use your flare token, you put two and a half times the value of your flare token. Uh, so you take your flare token, let's say you wish to mint um, $100 of um, F Doge, so Dogecoin on flare or you know, F Algo or FXRP, but let's just take Doge. Let's say you want to mint that. Um, you take uh, $250 uh, of your um, your uh, FLR, or you can essentially borrow it off someone else, and you, like that's 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 kind of how the system works. Mm -hmm. So basically, someone locks $250 of FLR in a smart contract, and then um, on the underlying chain, let's say that's Doge Coin, uh, the you know the Doge Coin chain. Um, someone with $100 of Doge can basically mint through the F asset system. They can mint that $100 of Doge onto Flare as $100 of F, F Doge. So you have $100 of F Doge essentially secured by $100 of Doge over here and $250 of FLR here. Now, there's a couple of different ways you can self-mint. Um, at which point, you, basically, it's your collateral that's locking your Doge, um, or you can basically borrow when it's someone else's collateral that's locking your Doge, but they receive the Doge in return, and you receive the F asset. So there's a, a couple of different ways you can do it, but the, the long and the short of it is we're using FLR to collateralize uh, the non-synthetic, so it's important, there is the token kind of underlying this whole system, the non-synthetic version of the underlying token on to the on, on to Flare. And where uh, people are essentially lending their FLR, then they're earning a return in the underlying network in say Doge, in XRP, in potentially in the future Bitcoin or Algorand or you know, all those different tokens. So they're earning the return. So you have your FLR, you earn the return for delegating to a data provider, and simultaneously, you can earn a return by collateralizing uh, the F asset system. It's really important that that is simultaneous. It's not either or, it's and. Um, and that's a really important part of the system. Uh, so we have this inflationary aspect, which is the Oracle. Uh, and then we have this uh, so what the inflationary aspect is doing is it's basically saying, we need this data. Uh, people who help us get this data are good participants of the network. Uh, and in return for being a good participant of the network, we're going to tax inflation, bad participants of the network. So people who don't, um, don't essentially uh, contribute to the network. So their value people who don't contribute or people that don't contribute well, their value is gonna to flow to you from inflation. Mm. But that's that's not enough because ultimately, if you just just end up with that scheme, uh, that's that doesn't build value. So what we're doing is we're moving the tokens around with the uh, FTSO. We're moving the ownership of value across the system, but to different participants, participants that are providing value in providing data. But, but then the question is, okay, so cool, we've moved this value around, for what reason? And then the ultimate reason is then to earn a return in a different token that is not part of the network. So in Doge, in XRP, in Stellar, in you know, potentially Bitcoin, in Algorand, in Litecoin. So you have this sort of two streams of earnings. Uh, it's really important because this is how like modern economies work. They have an internal system which moves around resources and they have an external system that allows them to earn, let's say, dollars. Um, and basically, the more you do inside the system, the more dollars you earn. And mm -hmm. that's kind of the analogy here. Um, and it's, a, it's, it's important because that then gives some uh, genuine utility to FLR or, or in the forerunner, Songbird. Um, and that's that's a very sort of important point I want to get across. Now I said I really, if you don't mind, I'm just going to continue for one second. 
because I said that really the F assets is the first model of thing that we can build with the state connector. State connector being this thing that allows us to see what's happened on another network. Now there's a different way to earn essentially foreign currency. So your XRP, your even your Ethereum maybe. Um, and that is, we have the FTSO, this data provider, and people could stake against the data provider. So basically put some money into a smart contract and, and say, I'm going to deliver the price of um, Dogecoin against the dollar. And I'm going to deliver that to the Ethereum network. And I'm going to ask people on Ethereum to pay me some fraction of a, of a penny for every 500 signals I deliver. Mm. And I'm going to stake uh, I'm going to stake against that. And if I'm wrong, if I deliver a crap signal, if I lie, um, you can take 50% of my stake per, per time that I lie. Um, and the stake connector can be the thing that determines whether you lied or not on the Ethereum network. And so that's a second way potentially to earn additional currency, additional foreign currency from your Flare or from your Songbird. Um, wow. Wow. I, I I can't, I'm just thinking about it and, you know, just like smoke signals going off in my head. I, like, I can't wait to test this out and uh, put some, to, some of my assets to work. Um, like I hold XRP Algorand. Um, so I would love to try it in Stellar as well. Um, so on that note, you know, I, obviously you guys are testing um, and certainly crawl, walk, run. We want to make sure everything works well. Um, on that note, is there a tentative date of potential Flare token release that you're aiming towards? Um, so there's a, a, I made a terrible mistake before by giving a date. Um, <laughs> and it really was, it was a terrible mistake. Uh, people have held me to it and um and it, 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 it damaged our reputation. So I'm not going to do that again. Yeah. Um, but we are, look, we as a team are more interested in many ways than the community in, get, you know, you, you know, a lot of these people that are, uh, we get a lot of questions on Twitter. When are you releasing the token and all that kind of stuff? Uh, or, or you scammed us or, you know, uh, you know, it's been so long. Of course, you know, uh, we are the people that want to get the token out. Like yeah. we, we're not making money from this. We didn't have any XRP leading into the snapshot that we basically, you know, we simply held no XRP. Then we didn't profit from the snapshot whatsoever. Um, so, you know, other than, you know, I think we had some XRP, which we were receiving some, some, some very small amount of XRP, which we we're receiving some flare for, but we didn't profit. It didn't do anything for us. So we are the people that really want to get the token out. But we're also the people that really don't want to screw this up. Sure. So, um, you know, so Songbird first testing, testing will testing will inform whether there needs to be changes made, um, whether we need to go, you know, change anything in the design, change anything in the code, change anything in the uh, in the way the economics works. Uh, you know, I'm very interested when it comes to Songbird of the effect of, you know, in the next couple of, you know, months, there's going to be probably exchanges distributing the token in a sequential manner. And actually, that'll be quite interesting because there's a very high reward right now uh, for delegating to the, um, to the uh, FTSO on Songbird because at the moment, less than, you know, only 15% is a huge number for five weeks, but it's also a small number in the long run. Only 15% of the token holders have delegated to, to the FTSO, which means that 100% of the rewards are going to 15% of the token holders. So as people, as the token comes to market, I want to see what happens because actually the situation with Songbird right now is very closely mirroring uh, what we want to do in the future with the Flare distribution, which is 15% on day one and then 3% thereafter. Mm -hmm. With the idea being that if there's an, that there should be an absorption of liquidity over time, because if you only distribute a small amount on day one, then the return from the protocols, very, very high. 
Uh, so I want to see how people respond to that because right now the return from the FTSO is extremely high. As more supply comes to market, uh, you know, theoretically, people should be, you know, very interested in absorbing the liquidity so as to get that return. Um, so we'll see if that's borne out. Um, and then that can also provide some very interesting, uh, you know, uh, essentially case studies for the economics of FLR and whether, you know, the community may wish to change the structure of the distribution. So I think that's uh, a really important thing to note. Um, well, I appreciate your transparency there and candidness. Um, uh, I certainly understand, you know, from the building standpoint, there's a lot of responsibilities on your end and you want to put out a, a product that works and doesn't have risks, um, which would obviously be a bigger problem for everybody. So I think certainly folks have to be patient and, and uh, you know, thank you for explaining all the things that you guys are working on. So um, here, I want to ask a question from the community about, you know, where do you see Flare in maybe three to five years? What's your roadmap or vision? Uh, essentially, you know, where do you guys see yourself then? So um, I think I've said this almost from day one. Um, we can't discuss anything that we may or may not do after other than the protocols we've already put white papers out for. Um, but having said that, you know, I think I think there's really interesting use cases for the snake connector. So I think that we're pioneering this really interesting model with with Flare and with Songbird. So the traditional model when people have tried to upgrade things like Ethereum to proof of stake is that you have this token, this staking token, and that then essentially needs to be somewhat locked, right? Because uh, ultimately most proof of stake, many proof of stake algorithms have, uh, have an idea of slashing, which is that um, you, know, you stake to a validator if that validator is malicious or lies, they get slashed, you lose money. And that's the incentive not to stake to a crap validator. Um, Flare doesn't have that model at all. It uses FBA, so there's no stake. And so we've been able to elaborate really interesting use cases for the token directly into the network. So instead of having a, a token that sits sort of on top of the network that's issued by a smart contract, this is our protocol token. And this allows us to uh, have the state connector. This allows us to have the FTSO. That's really important. Like we, we do have a kind of proof of stake in Flare, but it's not at the consensus level. It's at the Oracle level. Um, and so we kind of transferred, like we don't want to build consensus on, on proof of stake, but we are building uh, you know, uh, our Oracle on essentially a form of proof of stake. So we've pioneered this model. And, and this means that you've got the state connector, you have a super Oracle, um, you have a way of seeing what can happen on any other networks, and you have smart contracts on Flare. Those combination of things, like we've pioneered, we're basically we're pioneering two potential products. The first is the F assets, you know, which everyone knows like how that works, why they exist. Then possibly there's the idea that the FTSO data could be relayed to another network and uh, the relay can be slashed if uh, they put that network on, on, on that, uh, they could put that data on that network uh, in a malicious or a malicious way or it's stale or whatever. Um, so those are two products that use the state connector and the FTSO and then the third that is the, you know, the, the F assets. Um, I want to see what, what other people could build from these protocols. Like literally, this is a new thing that's never existed in blockchain before. Right. I think there's some really interesting stuff that could happen. So five years, I think, I think it's going to look completely unlike what I can predict, hopefully. Um, there's one question I forgot to ask you. Um, so the folks who did get their Songbird tokens, what wallet support? And also if they wanted to start leveraging the features of... yeah doing, uh, you know, lending Doge or whatever it may be, how do they go about doing that? I, I forgot to ask so, you. So lending Doge, I can't comment on because that doesn't exist as a protocol yet. Sure. Um, but in terms of um, 
accessing the token and using the flare times, delegating to the flare time series Oracle. That's that's awesome. So you asked earlier why we integrated the Ethereum virtual machine. One of the reasons is that it's because it, there's loads of wallets that are built for it. Mm. Um, and so uh, Flare already has support from MetaMask. MetaMask covers every EVM basically that exists. Um, and then we have Ledger, we have Trezor, we have Descent. Now Descent have built like a wicked portal for delegating uh, to, to uh, data providers on Songbird. Um, and then we have Bifrost, which is a software uh, wallet, uh, which is again, specifically built around Flare and Songbird. And at the moment it's really awesome for, for, for delegating your token. So uh, there's a number of different wallets, uh, hardware and software wallets. If you're looking for a hardware wallet, uh, you could go, you could do a lot worse than Descent. Uh, and then, so Descent gives you the most available functionality. Mm. Ledger and Trezor both support it, but you can use, you use the functionality through MetaMask. Uh, if you're looking for a software wallet, Bifrost is, you know, absolutely excellent. Oh, that's awesome. Um, I personally use Ledger, so... Um, I will definitely take a look at it once I get my respective tokens. Um, cool. I want to wrap it up here with the final question, and it's going to be rapid fire, such as uh, what's your favorite food? Sushi. Favorite musician or band? Apex Twin. Favorite movie? The Royal Tannenbaum. Uh, favorite book? Tale of Two Cities. And finally, when you're not at Flare working on Songbird and <laughs> the Flare tokens, uh, what, what are you doing for fun as a hobby? Uh, at the moment, I've been, it's winter, so I've been cooking a lot. Um, otherwise, during lockdown, I, I did certainly get quite into making quite, quite complex cocktails. Um, but otherwise, you know, all the standard stuff, I love to travel um and you know uh, uh one thing i really want to get back into is um uh rock climbing which is quite uh quite a was a passion and then i hurt my knee <laughs> hugo uh pleasure chatting with you and i'm excited uh for the release full release of uh the flare token and then flare network uh upgrades and things along those lines and i know it's a work in progress, so people do have to be patient, but thank you for the hard work and for being transparent and for the updates. Well, my pleasure, and yeah, thank you everyone for your patience. And um, I can tell you that the team are so thrilled, and I am so thrilled about the usage of Songbird and watching people interact with the network. Um, it gives us additional kind of, uh, I guess, sucker to go and like, you know, pu push out the state connector and push out the F assets. So thank you very much for engaging with us.